moving on to first session, may we invite the President of MMBA, Mr. S. Srinivas Raman, to come over to the dais. We request the guest speaker of the session, Honorable Mr. Jesus B. Ramasubramanian, to the dais. Thank you, Dibby Grace. Now I request Mr. T. S. Venkatramna, Senior Advocate, to honor the guest speaker of the session with the memento. Thank you, sir. Now I request Mr. M. Shivash Babu, Senior Advocate, to adorn the speaker with a traditional song. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lordship. His Lordship, before being elevated to the bench, was a leading lawyer and practiced law before various judicial fora for around 23 years, which includes Madras High Court, Central and State Administrative Tribunal, City and Small Cars Court, State Consumer Commission and District Consumer Forum. Although his area of practice was diverse, he specialized in service matters. His Lordship has immense contribution to Tamil language. He has authored a number of books in Tamil. One among them is The Principles of Law and Justice in Kambara Mine, Kamban in Sattamum Nidiyum. His Lordship also wrote a series of articles under the caption Beyond Science, Arivial Kappal in a Tamil newspaper. He discovered a new vocabulary of words to the language of Tamil by running a column in a Tamil newspaper under the caption Solvate. The digitization of the Madras High Court and subordinate courts in Tamil Nadu gained momentum under his leadership. The decision rendered by His Lordship in Consum Info Private Limited vs Google India was hailed as the first decision in India on the question of infringement of trademark by an internet search engine to its adverse policy. The decision is hailed by IPR experts as an encyclopedia on the legal issues involved. The rule of law and the independence of judiciary underpin our democracy and lie at the heart of our way of life. Judiciary is the very cornerstone of our freedoms. From the citizen's point of view, judiciary is the most important organ in strengthening democracy and liberal values in India. Judiciary is playing an extremely critical role from being the guardian of the constitution an able protector of the rights of the poor and disadvantaged groups and against the possible excesses of legislative and executive organs. In some way or other, we are all dependent on the great institution which is the crown of our constitutional republic. May I now request Honorable Mr. Justice V. Ramasubramanian, Judge of Supreme Court of India, to deliver his lecture on the topic, Judiciary as the Sinusha. Mr. Srinivas Raghavan, President of MMBA, Honorable Judges of the Madras High Court, Mr. Damas Yashadri Naidu, former Judge of the Bombay High Court and presently the Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court, Ms. Elizabeth, Vice Chancellor of uh, the Univers Law University, Ms. Mridullah Bhatkar, former Judge of the Bombay High Court, Learned Additional Advocate General, Deputy Solicitor General, Senior Advocates, Advocates and my dear friends. It always gives me immense pleasure to come back to Madurai. But the only difficulty this time is that I have been ordained to speak in English. Generally, I love speaking in Tamil to you and you love listening to me in Tamil. But I do not think that this is an occasion where we will have to get back to our old practices. <laughs> Pandemic produced a lot of bad things. But as lawyers, we knew how to turn every error into account. Therefore, MMBA created this lexicon turning a disaster into a positive affair in the form of online classes and conferences. Therefore, I congratulate MMBA for managing a disaster very well by opening up a process of learning. The legal profession is the only profession perhaps in the world where you yearn at every opportunity of learning something. The only difference between learning and yearning is the word is the alphabet L. All of us 
at the beginning of her career want to learn but after some time we would like to drop the alphabet l and to start to earn every client who comes to you with a case not only pays you money to sustain yourself but also pays you money to enrich your knowledge so he brings you both saraswati and lakshmi together and your success depends upon parvati <laughs> shakti in court therefore these symposiums are extremely important in the life of a lawyer and a judge today the topic that i have chosen is judiciary as the sinosure the word sinosure is defined in almost all the dictionaries to mean a person or thing that attracts a lot of attention or interest the merriam webster dictionary traces the etymology of the word sinosure as follows i quote ancient mariners noted that all the stars in the heavens seem to revolve around a particular star and they relied on it to guide their navigation the constellation in which this bright star appears is known as ursa minor or the little dipper but the ancient greeks called it kynosaura a term that comes from a phrase meaning dog's tail kynosaura in greek meant dog's tail kynosaura passed into latin and middle french becoming sinosure when english speakers adopted the term in the mid 16th century they used it as a name for the constellation and the star which is also known as the north star and also to identify a guide of any kind by the early 17th century sinosure was also being used figuratively for anything or anyone that like the north star was the focus of attention or observation this is what merriam webster dictionary speaks about the etymology of the word sinosure therefore when we talk about judiciary as the sinosure there are two ways of approaching the topic one is to convey a very positive feeling that judiciary is like the north star that guides people who have lost their ways i do not think uh, how many people were agree with this view outside this auditorium the second option is to apply the ordinary meaning of the word and say that judiciary attracts a lot of attention and observation i think that is the safest of the definitions whether we like it or not judiciary has been attracting a lot of attention sometimes in the positive way and sometimes in a very negative way this is true of judiciary the world over and not just in india let us first see how it happens traditionally the role envisaged for the judiciary was only as an arbiter of private disputes in civil matters and as an institution providing due process for prosecuting persons accused of offenses so long as the role of the courts was confined to civil and criminal matters the attention that the judiciary attracted was minimal but soon as the judiciary assumed the role of a watchdog of democracy and started playing a greater role providing checks and balances against abuse or arbitrary exercise of power by other branches of governments the institution became not just a sinosure but also an eyesore therefore my attempt before you today is to showcase the way in which judiciary is seen worldwide sometimes as a hero and sometimes as a villain and never as uh, an anti hero but the way people look at it either as hero or villain depends upon which side of the table they are and at what point of time so it becomes a matter of convenience if you stand up against the ruling dispensation 
the opposition hails you as a champion so long as they continue to be in the opposition but the moment the roles are reversed the tone and tenor of the voices change this is what i normally describe as a power syndrome if you sit in the opposition bench you speak the language of democracy if you adorn the treasury bench you speak the language of power there is a vast distinction between when you speak the language of democracy and when you speak the language of power but unfortunately the courts have to speak only in one language therefore either one of them start attacking judiciary we all know that there are different types of governments such as number 1 monarchy either absolute or constitutional number 2 republic either democratic or presidential or parliamentary and number 3 totalitarian either dictatorship or fascism or communism or oligarchy or anarchy and number 4 democracy these are the accepted forms of government in countries governed by totalitarian regimes judiciary has an extremely limited role to play judiciary in these countries do not attract any attention in totalitarian countries independence be it judicial or otherwise is a term not available in the dictionary of those countries therefore there is no problem for the judiciary in those countries take for instance china even the top judges of china believe that there is nothing called judicial independence on january 14 2017 zhou qing president of the supreme people's court of china declared that judicial independence is a western trap and that chinese courts must dare to pull out the sword to combat the western notions in fact a comprehensive campaign was conducted in beijing to vilify all western values targeting everything from ngos to university textbooks even the phrase constitutional democracy was replaced in china by the idea of governance in accordance with the constitution they did not like the word constitutional democracy in countries where the governments are not totalitarian the judiciary is called upon to perform a neutral role to the satisfaction of people with competing or conflicting interests in these countries the ruling is pitted against the opposition the right wing is pitted against the left wing the liberals pitted against the conservatives national security pitted against absolute freedom economic interests pitted against environmental concerns individual or group interests clashing with community interests majority flexing its muscle against minority or vice versa scholars argue that strict enforcement by courts of the rule of law will balance all these competing or conflicting interests but when courts do so one of the groups certainly gets offended and courts become an eyesore instead of being sinosure what is interesting to note is that attack on judiciary is not just by politicians but by media public commentators academics and sometimes the members of the legal fraternity itself in a paper presented by justice michael kirby of the high court of australia in the year 1998 in the winter leadership meeting organized by the american bar association michael kirby quotes several instances of attacks on judiciary in several countries such as united kingdom new zealand australia and the usa he did not quote what happens in india he quotes the following instances of attack i quote this is what he writes the beverbrook press claimed that there was a sickness sweeping through the senior judiciary galloping arrogance with just a little hubris the editorialist declared 
that while european human rights judges some from countries which once sent political prisoners to siberia are venting their spleen on britain legal weevils here at home are practicing their own brand of mischief the rothermore press said now it seems that any judge can take it on himself to overrule a minister even though parliament might approve of the minister's action this is to arrogate to themselves power in a manner that makes a mockery of parliament the judges are giving the impression that they are acting on a political agenda of their own this is what michael kirby quoted the times at that time demanded that a new chief justice be appointed who could steer his profession away from the sound of gunfire in australia the high court which is the equivalent of our supreme court delivered a judgment in 1996 holding that native title to land of the indigenous people of australia was not extinguished by the pastoral leases granted by the crown this and certain other decisions of the high court of australia and the justices were labeled by the press in the following terms the press used the following epithet they said these judgments are bogus the judges are pusillanimous and evasive guilty of plunging australia into the abyss a pathetic self appointed group of kings and queens a group of basket weavers gripped in a mania of progressivism purveyors of intellectual dishonesty unaware of its place adventurous needing a good behavior bond he said the judges need a good behavior bond on the contrary they should be sentenced to life on the streets they are unfaithful servants of the constitution they undermine democracy and judiciary is a body packed with feral judges a professional labor cartel these are the epithets that were used against judges in australia in 1998 therefore we judges here in india should not educate people about what is happening in other countries because we are in danger according to justice michael kirby the price for the worst examples in a developed country in this genre of political attack on judiciary must go to the united states of america the reason is that federal political leaders in the us often look around for themes for their electoral campaign selecting the easy targets of the judiciary as a means of promoting themselves as tough on law and order one of the disturbing features of the attacks on the judiciary in the united states is the way the attacks are followed up by removal from office or threats of impeachment of judges who require popular retention or re-election vote you may be aware of the fact that judges of state judiciary not federal judiciary in us are required to seek election take your breath these elections can prove to be very deplorably costly in a recent election of a judge to the supreme court of wisconsin can you imagine what was the amount spent a staggering amount of 45 million us dollars was spent on the election to the office of a judge of the supreme court of wisconsin both liberals and conservatives competed with each other they went on a fundraising campaign ultimately the liberal judge won the vote and she got elected to office fortunately fundraising campaigns are not known here to the outside world the judges so elected can also be voted out of office in us if their decisions are not to the liking of the electorate the new york times carried a report on november 10 2010 about an unprecedented vote to remove three iowa state supreme court justices what was the reason the reason was that a seven member panel 
of the Iowa Su- Su- State Supreme Court voted unanimously in the previous year to strike down a law defining marriage as between a man and a woman making the state the first in the midwest to permit same sex marriage the seven member panel of the iowa state supreme court disapproved a law which recognized marriage as something that can happen only between a man and a woman it said same sex marriages are permissible therefore if there is a judge here who has permitted that i wish he had been in iowa what happened was after they completed their 3 year term the electorate voted three justices of the iowa state supreme court out of office for taking a particular position on this legal issue the leaders of this recall campaign the judges should be recalled recall campaign said the results should be a warning to judges elsewhere one of them said i think it will send a message across the country that the power resides with the people said bob vander plats an unsuccessful republican candidate for governor who led the campaign he said it is we the people and not we the courts you will be surprised to know that 200 church organizations collected money for voting three, these three justices out of office because they thought that same sex marriage could not be approved by court in england many times the media goes berserk in their criticism of judges the 4th november 2016 edition of the daily mail a newspaper a british tabloid published from london carried a report the caption given to the report was enemies of the people the caption was enemies of the people and it showed three judges of a particular court hanging upside down the picture was carried along with this the newspaper was actually referring to three honorable judges of the supreme court of england and wales the reason was a unanimous decision rendered by the court on 3rd november 2016 setting aside the government's attempt to give notice under article 50 of the treaty on european union for the united kingdom to withdraw from the european union all of you know that the united kingdom became part of uh, uh, what is now known as european union in 1973 from the year 9- 2010 onward there were cries for withdrawal from the european union therefore a referendum was made 52% of the population voted that britain should go out of european union therefore a notice was issued under, under article 50 of the treaty for getting out of european union this notice came to be challenged before the high court of england and wales and these three judges said that the process prescribed by the statute has not been followed therefore it was set aside the moment it was set aside the parliamentarians got enraged some of them led by a minister of justice it is always the minister of justice who leads the attack on judiciary wherever it is i am talking about other countries he attacked the judiciary saying that an unholy alliance of die hard remain campaigners look at the coinage of words this uh, minister of justice said an unholy alliance has been formed between die hard remain campaigners remain campaigners are those who wanted britain to be to remain as part of the european union he was in truck with a fund manager and an unelected judiciary he said the unholy alliance of die hard remain campaigners a fund manager and an unelected judiciary thwarted the wishes of 17.4 million voters who wanted to leave the european union they said three judges can upset the decision of 17.4 million people what nonsense is this was his question the newspaper also reported that the outpouring of rage against the high court's shocking judicial activism was so strong that there were calls in england there were calls in england for a review of the way judges were appointed i am talking about the calls in england about the way judges were being appointed whether we accept it or not courts today wield enormous powers 
including political power at times the today the courts have the power to declare the election of the head of the state as null and void and unseat him this power flowing out of legislation enacted by the parliament itself and exercised by the unelected judiciary irks elected representatives that is the problem just see what happened in kenya in 2017 an election was held on august 8 2017 for the office of president in kenya a person called uhuru kenyatta was declared elected just as we have the election commission of india kenya has a commission called independent election and boundaries commission iebc <coughs> uhuru kenyatta was declared elected elected by this independent election and boundaries commission but his election was challenged before the supreme court of kenya in a historic ruling the supreme court of the republic of kenya held as follows i quote from the judgment the operative portion of the judgment <coughs> the court declared a declaration is hereby issued that the presidential election held on 8th august 2017 in kenya was not conducted in accordance with the constitution of the republic of kenya and the applicable law rendering the declared results invalid null and void an order is hereby issued directing the first respondent to organize and conduct a fresh presidential election in strict conformity with the constitution this is what the court declared notably the sixth judge supreme court panel found that the incoming incumbent president kenyatta was not engaged in any election mal practice instead they found the election commission had engaged in various irregularities and illegalities in the transmission of the results they found fault with the procedure followed and they upset the fall upset the results while hailing the verdict as historic and a win for the kenyans and the rule of law a senior research fellow at the africa growth initiative wrote something very very poignant i quote it is important for kenyans to understand that the winner here is not the opposition but kenya and its democratic institutions a hundred years from now this decision will be remembered not because it granted the opposition another opportunity to capture the presidency or cheated the incumbent out of a win but because it reaffirmed kenyans strong belief in constitutionalism peaceful resolution of conflict and the rule of law what this ruling has done is to save the country from unnecessary bloodshed and the place it on the path to peace and democratic governance it has granted kenyans a second chance to think about how they want to move forward and be governed now it is time for the pol- kenya's political elites to seek to build political parties based not on ethnicity but on those ideals which are ch- cherished by all kenyans therefore that was hailed as a victory for the rule of law and not a victory for the opposition interestingly after the court upset the victory of kenyatta and the second election was held the very same kenyatta again won therefore again a group of scholars raised a question that why you wasted so much of money and what who's cost if the same person is going to be elected again what was the point in your setting aside the election and making the country spend so much of money in going in for a second election the economic impact of the decision came to be criticized even after the first decision was hailed as upholding the rule of law now take for instance the case of italy in italy the parliament approved a law known as lodo schifani in 2003 granting immunity from prosecution to the president of the republic the prime minister and the speakers this immunity was extended even to the offenses committed by them before they got elected therefore all your past sins got uh, washed away the moment you get elected to the office 
but the law was declared as unconstitutional by the nation's constitutional court in 2018 after removing all the procedural infirmities pointed out by the court in the first instance a second law was passed which was called alfono law that law again granted immunity in the year 2008 in fact the very object of passing this law was to grant immunity to the incumbent in office the berlusconi's first tax he wanted to get immunity from bribery charges which he was facing he was facing bribery charges and also charges of giving false testimony to protect his businesses there was also a case of tax fraud and indulging in prostitution against the president of the country he wanted immunity from all this but the italian constitutional court for a second time held the second law also to be unconstitutional the judge stated that the suspension of trials derogated from the principle of equality and created a privilege and that this could only be achieved by a constitutional amendment what the italian court said was the immunity has been brought forth by a normal law if it had been brought forth by a constitutional amendment the result could have been otherwise was how the italian constitutional court viewed this the reaction to this ruling of the supreme court was quite interesting the 73 year old prime minister that berlusconi depicted the decision as a politically motivated ruling by the constitutional court five of whose 15 members are selected by the president five by the judiciary five by the parliament he said the constitutional court is a political organ but we will carry on the trials against me are as a, are a farce and he lifted his fist and said viva italia viva berlusconi that means hail uh, the rule of democracy after condemning the judiciary he said this therefore all over the world this is the position in a recent report a group of polish judges highlighted the repressive activities of the disciplinary chamber the report describes instances of judges being prosecuted for engaging in allegedly political activities what are those political activities such as chairing a meeting where judicial independence is discussed polish authorities see that if a judge is on a dais in a platform where judicial independence is discussed then he is charged with engaging in political activity in other cases judges were prosecuted for referring questions to the european court of justice poland continues to be part of the european union therefore the matters can be taken to the european court of justice if judges refer questions of law to european court of justice polish authorities thought that he is carrying out what is known as judicial excesses in turkey an unsuccessful coup took place on 15th july 2016 the day after the failed coup attempt some of the turkey's top judges called for an emergency meeting the 22 justices known as the high council of judges and prosecutors are responsible for appointment of judges but this time this council turned against their own kitan kin and they sacked nearly 3000 subordinate judges on charges that they aided and abetted people who wanted to overthrow the government in the ngo human rights watch reported that turkey's courts have placed at least 1684 judges and prosecutors in pre trial detention in the aftermath of the failed coup they were detained on suspicion that they were members of a terrorist organization or were involved in a coup attempt lawyers were reluctant to represent judges in these cases for fear that by association they may be termed as terrorists it will be of interest to note that erdogan was once jailed for reciting a poem erdogan and whose regime all this came he was once jailed for reciting a poem at a political rally but after rising to power he styled himself 
as a champion of freedom of justice and this is what he did to the freedom of justice actually his early push for judicial reforms were hailed by the western media but after two decades in power he showed that the language of power is completely different from the language of democracy and both cannot coexist in recent times you must have read what is happening in israel you must have watched in television the ongoing huge protests happening in israel against judicial reforms what is happening and why is it happening after the present coalition government came to power in israel the justice minister yariv levin announced in january 2023 a set of judicial reforms that sought to cut down the powers of the supreme court to review laws and to strike them down justice minister yariv levin said this is what he said the supreme court's growing intervention in cabinet decisions and neset legislation neset k n e s s e t neset is the parliament neset legislation he says the growing intervention of the supreme court in cabinet decisions had ruined public trust in the legal system leading to severe damage to democracy he said something very interesting which resonates all over the world he said the justice minister said we go to the polls vote elect and the time after time people who did not elect choose for us what we should do that was his complaint i go to polls i beg people for voting they vote me to power and the people who get unelected easily overturn my decisions many sectors of the public look to the judicial system and do not find their voices being heard therefore we wanted these reforms is what he said the reforms that they proposed in israel was actually in four parts the first part conferring power upon the neset the parliament to override supreme court decisions they said if a supreme court pronounces a decision parliament which is supreme can pass a law overturning the decision that was the first part of the reform the second part of the reform reform tended to take away the power of the supreme court to strike down a law on the standard of reasonableness the third part of the reform was about changing the method of appointment of judges and the fourth part enabling ministers to appoint their own legal advisers that invited less of criticism if i elaborate on the third part of the reforms namely the change in the method of appointment of judges you may wonder whether i am talking about israel or some other country you are familiar with as of now judges in israel are chosen by a committee of nine members three supreme court judges two representatives of the israel bar association and four members who are elected representatives two ministers and two neset members but under the reforms the two representatives from the israel bar association would be replaced by two public representatives chosen by the justice minister therefore majority goes to the hands of the executive this would give the sitting government a majority of the votes for selection of judges interestingly the reforms proposed in israel had its own quota of supporters from the media the executive editor of israel law and liberty forum is a very um, celebrated individual he wrote an open ed column in the times of israel which supported the reforms in the following words he said i quote a closer look at the proposed reforms reveals a measured justified and indeed a patently democratic response to decades of illegitimate judicial overreach and he added that changes hardly warrant a collective panic attack the he continued the real democratic deficit can be found in the past 30 years of judicial supremacy where the court may override the israeli parliament and has final say on any matter it chooses despite no actual constitutional anchor enabling such authority we have had such instances in the past in our own country i don't think i need to elaborate on this 
all of you know how we moved on from position to position the position in india is uh, that the judiciary here is continuously seen by any ruling dispensation to be posing a threat to the legitimate exercise of power given by the electorate how it all started was first our courts stood up for personal liberties then our courts questioned the executive decisions that infringed upon fundamental rights from there the courts slowly moved on to question the policy decisions then the rules framed by the executive in exercise of the power conferred by the statutes were struck down as ultra virus the act from there the courts moved on to strike down parliamentary enactments as unconstitutional when the constitution itself was amended the courts originally showed deference on the ground that parliament is supreme but later the court held that there are limits to the power of the parliament to amend the constitution eventually the court ended up evolving the basic structure doctrine therefore what happened in our country was we started first with contracts we made a distinction between statutory contracts and non statutory contracts then we moved on to question the economic policies of the state the original view that economic policies of the state cannot be questioned later altered to some extent from there we moved on to social justice from there we moved on to gender justice then to environment environmental issues thereafter to safe workplace atmosphere for women and there is no single area today which is left untouched by courts in india and this is perhaps the reason why the courts have become sinosher or iso the survey of what is happening across the globe shows that judiciary is perceived by the elected representatives as a thorn in the flesh with judges wielding enormous powers to do un- to undo what a parliament can do with no accountability while politicians are accountable to the voters who elected them and they they are required to go back to the electorate once in 5 years judges are perceived as persons who are not accountable this is an irritant for the political class nick friedman of st anne's college oxford put it very pithily he said judges are not elected representatives and hence they suffer from a democratic deficit therefore there is a perception the judiciary lacks institutional legitimacy alexander bickel an american law professor says courts have a counter majoritarian dilemma which embraces three related claims what are they number 1 judges being unelected suffer from a democratic deficit number 1 number 2 they often invalidate statutes of a democratically elected legislature number 3 courts give certain groups an unequal opportunity to influence the political process and these are the three problems which the judiciary has to take on according to uh, alexander bickel i think this problem is not very peculiar to any country this has now become a universal phenomenon wherever there is a democracy in place wherever there is fascism communism or totalitarian regimes there the courts have no problem at all because they are confined only to being arbiters of personal disputes and being uh, institutions which ensure due process whenever somebody is prosecuted but the moment you get transformed into an institution which can exercise power then you become a sign of the wall eyes so with these few words uh, i thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity thank you very much thank you lot sir now the forum is open for interactions delegates may ask questions ask a question yeah. lot sir said uh, that uh, strict applicability of rule of law is practically impossible as it will dissatisfy the other party no no i never said it is impossible i said application of the rule of law always uh, brings with it 
disappointment from the group against whom it is enforced. In the United States, you also there is a practice of uh, light telecasting of a municipal court yes. under the caption of court and providence. Lord Sir, but do you think that such practice, if it is adopted in India, will it uh, reduce the dissent of judiciary with the general public? I do not think the live telecast of proceedings is an answer to the question because, see, in a court case, there is always a winning party, there is always a losing party. However much you telecast, live telecast or even recorded proceedings, it is not going to satisfy the party who loses. It may perhaps be a check on false propaganda against what happened in court, that's all. But uh, sometimes judges themselves get exposed in live proceedings. Hold your tongue is the first uh, lesson when you are before a camera. That is, therefore, you must always hold your script ready. Without a script, nobody goes to acting. And in front of the ca camera, you have to act. Thank you, Ramsey. Yes. May I now invite Mr. C.B. Chakravarti to come over to the rise to give his observation about the lecture. Good morning, everyone. What a day to begin with. What a speech, my ourselves. I can't explain in words. What an honor and privilege it has been for all of us to listen to your Lordship's speech. And it is, I would say, a once in a lifetime opportunity for me to share a short uh, feedback on behalf of the entire audience to your Lordship's fine oration. Your Lordship aptly thrown light as to why the judiciary has drawn the attention of public like that of a lighthouse in an island. In fact, your Lordship has given us an insight as to what is happening in the entire world with regard to the judiciary. In respect of China, Kenya, Australia, Britain, United States, Italy, Poland, Turkey and Israel. And as to how the judiciary is prone to criticism by the press, media and the politicians. Agreeing with your Lordships, I am sure that we lawyers and other members of the legal fraternity think that the judiciary has withstood the amount of threat from the public press and we as a lawyers would always stand together in upholding the judiciary independence. In fact, today's sinosia for us, the former part of the meaning of sinosia goes to Your Lordship Justice V. Ram Subramaniam, who has been the former part of the meaning Sinosia, namely the North Star today. And when it comes to the second, he stands the synonym of Sinosia uh, when it comes to Tamil. He attracts a lot of attention. Last but not the least, we, the members of MMBA, miss your voice echoing on Kambaramayanamam and Kannadasan in uh, Mahatma Gandhi Hall, which happened 10 years ago. With few words, I thank V. Ramasubhim, Your Worship Justice, for raising the occasion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Subhi Chakravarti, for your valuable feedback.